Good evening, everyone. Uh, we are MedGenome, the leaders of genetic diagnostics in India. And uh, we welcome you to this webinar on a very interesting topic on genomic landscape of lung cancer. So without wasting any, much, uh, any more time, I would like to introduce our speakers for tonight. Our first speaker is Dr. Aju Matthew. Uh, he is currently associated as a consultant oncologist and hematologist with, uh, with the Endocrinum Medical Center. He also takes care of patient and medical uh, college at Colon and Cherry. And uh, he was also a faculty at the National Cancer Institute uh, designated to Markey uh, Cancer Center of the University of Kentucky. And after graduating uh, in medicine from Government Medical College Trivandrum, he has gained uh, further training in Cambridge University in England, uh, Karol, uh, uh, Ska University in Sweden and University of Pittsburgh. And his research has been published in several high impact journals in the field of medicine. So a uh, warm welcome to Dr. Aju. Our second speaker is Dr. Arun. So Dr. Arun uh, is currently associated. He's the head of technical support and oncology at MedGenome Labs in Bangalore. And uh, he has a 15 plus years, years of experience in human genomics and is a PhD in human population genetics. Uh, Dr. Uh, Arun also has technical expertise in genome analysis and uh, next, uh, next generation sequencing data analysis, statistical analysis of genetic data, cytogenetics, FISH, uh, assay of design, uh, and NGS uh, of clinical laboratory. So uh, now I will hand over to Dr. Aju Matthew for his talk. And I would just like to inform everyone that we'll be taking up question, question answers at the end of the session. So over to Dr. Aju. Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, uh, dear participants, dear colleagues for uh, spending your valuable uh, evening with us. Uh, I would like to talk about lung cancer and that too, a particular subset of lung cancer called the non-small cell lung cancer. But most importantly, I would like to discuss the genomic landscape of non-small cell lung cancer. Now, why is this important that it merits a discussion on a weekday evening when most of us are back from work? Uh, we know that in India, uh, the number of lung cancers are gradually rising. Although it is commonly seen in men, it is also significantly seen in women as well. Uh, Non-small cell lung cancer is the predominant type of adenocarcinoma, uh, predominant type of lung cancer. Uh, cases globally, there are different subtypes called squamous cell carcinoma and large cell uh, cancer. Uh, what has changed is in the last uh, several years, there has been a lot of change in therapy. What has changed? If the past we used to give chemotherapy for every single patient with lung cancer, if they can tolerate it. Now, before we administer chemotherapy or makeup plans, we do some genetic testing. Now, lung cancer the field of lung cancer is at the frontier of how we are advancing genome-based therapy in lung cancer. Now, what is the difference? What are the various things that we look for? Uh, that is, uh, there are several mutations in a human being's genome that can be altered. According to the, the Human Genome Project, which is the first time the human genome was, match, was mapped, the prevalence of EGFR mutation is around 10 to 50 percentage. Uh, the prevalence of uh, KRAS mutation in lung cancer was 25 percentage. ALK alteration was in the range of 5 percentage. ROS1 is in the range of 1 to 2 percentage. And there are several smaller ones too. What has been found is if we targeted some of these mutations with some of the approved drugs, then patients live longer than if they were not given targeted therapy. So what is the frequency of oncogenic driver mutations in lung cancer? The most common mutation seen in lung cancer among all the mutations is KRAS mutation. Even within that mutation, the change in KRAS gene, the most common one is G12C, constitutes about 39% of mutations. The next more prominent mutation is a mutation that happens in the gene called EGFR. 
and there are several other genes that are mutated or amplified or translocated in small proportions. Now for us, uh, one percentage does not mean much, but if you are that patient who is that one, then it means a lot. I remember when I used to do our uh, medical school in anatomy lecture hall, uh, we uh, were dissecting bodies and there is this nice plaque written in the uh, lecture hall, the dissection room that says, for you, this patient is probably one in a thousand, but for the family, that patient is the one. Um, so uh, all of this matters, even if uh, the proportion or the prevalence of these mutations are small, for that individual patient, it matters a lot. Currently, when a patient has advanced lung cancer, we do a biopsy. We try to figure out what histologic subtype they belong. In the past, patients with adenocarcinoma automatically got molecular testing, essentially to figure out what kind of mutation they have, if they have it. Now, recently, we also do pdl one testing because immunotherapy is a good option for patients who have higher expression of pdl one Squamous cell carcinoma patients, if they are found to be uh, with that subtype, you could consider molecular testing. There is no hardcore evidence that we should do it, but the evidence is uh, emerging that in India, even for squamous cell carcinoma, the prevalence of mutation in some of these targets is much more commonly seen than seen in the Western population. So uh, if I can make a comparison, in squamous cell carcinoma, EGFR mutation is around 5% in India, whereas in the West, it's around under 1% each. So something very significant. Um, what are these various alterations that we need to look for? EGFR, predominantly in the exons 18 through 21, the most common ones are exon 19, exon 21 changes. Why are they important? Because there are medicines, tyrosine kinase inhibitors, there are signal transduction inhibitors like osimertinib, erlotinib, gefitinib that can be used to target these mutations, these driver mutations, and can help curtail cancer cell proliferation. Whereas some mutations like T790M mutation also symbolizes resistance to some of these therapy. However, a drug called osimertinib is useful in that context. There are some other mutations or insertions called exon 20 insertion that are generally resistant to tyrosine kinase inhibitors. So knowing the type of alteration and where it happens is quite important to figure out what therapy they may respond to. ALK fusion uh, is tested using a test called FISH test. ALK immunohistochemistry test, which is looking for protein expression of this fusion, pro, uh, fusion gene, fused translocated gene, is also uh, important uh, because that is also very sensitive. Uh, if a patient has ALK mutation, there are various first, second generation options, third generation options available. Uh, another uh, mutation that is very prevalent, but is an emerging target is something called KRAS G12C mutation. This is usually picked up through PCR or a next-gen sequencing panel. Uh, the prevalence is pretty big. There is an emerging therapy, which has just been FDA approved called Sotorasib that can be used for this uh, mutation. I have never used this medicine. However, in another clinical trial context for a G12A mutation, I have used uh, something called Selumetinib, which is a MEK inhibitor, uh, but that has not been proven to be of much use in that context. Sotorasib causes results in response rates in the order of one in three. That is if one, uh, three people get it, nearly 1% or more, one out of those three responds beautifully to this medicine. But uh, in patients with colon cancer, for instance, who have KRAS mutation, it doesn't respond that well. So uh, in oncology, there was a time when we always used to think we are gonna practice genome-based practice and not a disease-specific practice, for instance, I wouldn't do, I would not do breast cancer clinics. I wouldn't do lung cancer clinic. Instead, I would do EGFR clinic or an ALK clinic or a KRAS clinic. But the experience with using some of these medicines across various cancers bring to doubt whether it is that easy or not. Because the experience, if I can take an example that is published today in the Lancet Oncology, the KRAS G12C response rate in lung cancer is around 39 percentage. Response rate in colon cancer is much, much lower than that. Another mutation is ROS1. There's another one called BRAS, 
NTRK123 fusion alteration is very rare. Uh, the incidence in Indian population is a 0.2 percentage, but there is an emerging therapy uh, or an FDA approved therapy called larotrectinib or entrectinib that is remarkable for these types of alterations. There are some cancers that uh, have a, a larger prevalence compared to 0.2%, the larger prevalence, for instance, salivary gland tumors have more prevalence of NTRK1 mutation. But if you don't know all these things, you won't be able to search for it. You won't feel like searching for it. If you don't search for it, you won't find it. If you don't find it, you can't use this therapy. And some of these therapy could be life-changing for patients. Another patient that recently considered me has a RET alteration, a rearrangement of RET mutation, RET gene, uh, that is more commonly seen in thyroid cancer, but less commonly seen in lung cancer. And there are two drugs that are approved recently called selpercatinib or pralcetinib. Uh, I've never used these medicines. These are just about uh, arriving in India. Uh, compassionate use have been done, but uh, since it's FDA approved, uh, I think we are awaiting a launch in India. But there are patients uh, who have benefited from these drugs in clinical trial and in clinical practice abroad. PDL1 is something that we have all been hearing about. The more a patient expresses PDL1 in the cell's uh, surface, the greater the likelihood that they will respond to immunotherapy in lung cancer. Another common alteration is HER2 amplification of mutation. In fact, there is so much data that is coming out from the destiny series of trials that shows that HER2 mutations or amplifications. Uh, patients respond beautifully if they have lung cancer and HER2 mutation. Uh, the drug, drug is called trastuzumab deruxtecan, TDX. The one that is listed in the slide is adotrastuzumab emtansin or TDM1. There are newer antibody drug conjugates that can really target these mutations. So as we move forward, we are seeing greater uh, emerging uh, drug targets, greater development of uh, uh, more focused, targeted, and uh, more effective medications. EGFR mutation, I just talked about uh, the exons 18 through 21. The major predominant ones that we look for are exon 19 and 21, but exon 20 alterations are also important because it signifies resistance to certain therapy or resistance to all therapy, for instance. Exon 20 insertion is a challenge for all of us. We don't really know how to manage this. A drug that has just been approved abroad um, is called amivantinib, amivantinib. Uh, and th that has been shown to be effective in patients with exon 20 insertion. I personally have used another drug called poziotinib. It, it also has some activity, but poziotinib is not very easily tolerable. So these are tyrosine kinase inhibitors, different versions of it, which previously were tried for exon 19 and 21, but were shelved because of the toxicity. But when repurposed for exon 20 insertion have been shown to have some activity. Uh, so this is a brief summary of some of what I was, uh, I was just talking about. In terms of EGFR mutation, a lot of these things have changed over time. We first identified EGFR uh, in 1977, 78, and then in 2003, Jefitinib was approved. Um, and in uh, 2004, Erlotinib was approved. And then in 2005, resistance mutation called T790M resistance mutation was identified. And later on in uh, 2015, 10 years later, a drug called osimertinib was approved that can be used in patients with T790M mutation. In a very similar way, uh, we are uh, seeing the Keras G12C uh, also being developed. Uh, although Sotoracid has been approved for Keras G12C, which is one of the most prevalent mutations in lung cancer, non-small cell adenocarcinoma, uh, but um, resistance develops rather dramatically. In fact, a recent publication in New England Journal of Medicine talked about all the various resistance mutations that can develop in the context of patient being on sotoracid. So the field is uh, dramatically moving forward. If in the past, the first resistance mutation was reported in 2005 and a drug targeting that was reported in 2015, 10 years, I expect that we would have more uh, drugs that would uh, bypass some of these resistance mutation for the newer drugs to happen maybe at a much shorter interval. ALK resistance mutations are another challenge. I talked about ALK alteration in one to 2 percent of lung cancer. There are various types of medications we can use, but some of these medications uh, result in resistance mutation. Identifying that resistance mutation can help us pick the next level of therapy or can help us in drug development as more and more patients are living longer with ALK resistance mutation. In fact, if a patient has ALK mutation or alteration, 
the expected anticipated survival is now more than five years, whereas in the past, this was a very tough disease to manage. A right alteration, uh, two new drugs have been approved called selpercatinib and pralcitinib. This is rare, more common in uh, thyroid cancer, but uh, must be looked out for in uh, lung cancer as well. MET exon 14 skipping mutation or MET amplification is an uncommon mutation, but uh, there are several emerging drugs. Capmatinib, has, uh, a friend of mine has used this medicine has, and has shown uh, substantial benefit for a patient. Capmatinib, crizotinib can be useful in patients with MET, uh, MET alteration. ROS1 alteration, again, this is another rare one, but this is another cancer that can go to the brain uh, rather quickly. In this context, a drug used in ALK alteration called crizotinib, first generation ALK mutation uh, targeted therapy, has been found to be effective for patients with ROS1 positive lung cancer. Um, NTRK fusion alteration, like I said, is more common in some uh, rare cancers like salivary gland cancer, but we have two drugs and it is not uncommon. It is an uncommon mutation, but it is not, uh, not seen. It is, you, you do tend to pick it up the more you do testing. And uh, if you find an NTRK one, two, three alteration, which results in quantitative activation of the tropomycin receptor kinases, TRK ABC, then uh, you have a drug available called a, a larotrechnib or entrechnib, which would also soon be launched in the Indian market shortly. Um, although the major, major argument from my colleagues in the surgical world and the pulmonology world, in fact, they are the ones who help us diagnose these cancers, but uh, they have this uh, uh, doom and gloom feel all the time. They feel like one, once patients have lung cancer, there's no point doing anything. So uh, when we get the referrals, which is not very commonly, um, we can test all these things. But I think uh, similar lectures must be taken for surgeons and uh, pulmonary medicine specialists to figure out, to understand that there are a lot of alterations, there's mutations that can be targeted and patients can have remarkable results, even if they have multiple uh, brain metastatic disease. I discussed about Keras at various instances. BRF B600 E mutation is also very targetable. Dabrafenib and Tremetinib is combination is used, uh, previously extensively used in melanoma, but then used in uh, BRF uh, V600 E mutation, positive lung cancer, uh, almost nearly similar effectiveness have been found. PDL1 testing is another uh, testing modality that we use these days to figure out if patients can benefit from immunotherapy. Uh, if PDL1 is high, then the, uh, you have the option of not even requiring chemotherapy. Patients may respond to just uh, immunotherapy by itself. But with the uh, PDL1 being less in expressing, or if it is negative, then you may need to add chemotherapy to the mix to help bring the response that you may want to uh, get. Uh, these are the various uh, drug approvals that have happened over the year. As years are going by, as uh, recent times have proven to us, significant number of drug approvals are happening at, the, uh, at, a, at a pace that even I cannot uh, catch up as an oncologist who practices this day in day out. It's become very complex to handle all of these various uh, new drugs and new approvals that are coming in. But it's good for our patients. Um, eventually, the cost will be driven down as uh, uh, emerging drugs at, uh, attain and come to the Indian market. But clearly, we need indigenous drug development to help uh, advance the field. Tumor mutation burden is another uh, emerging uh, biomarker. Uh, what is tumor mutation burden? It is an approximate measure of the total number of somatic mutations that can be seen in a patient's tumor tissue. Uh, why does it matter? Because we know that immunotherapy works best when patients have a lot of new antigens. Uh, a lot of new antigens means uh, there is a lot of tumor uh, immune lymph lymphocyte interaction that can be negatively modulated. Uh, you can positively modulate it uh, by using immunotherapy. But one way to figure out a high new antigen level is by going through the genome and figuring out if they have a high number of somatic mutation. And one way to do that is by uh, finding the burden of mutation in tumor, otherwise called TMB, tumor mutation burden. It is quite high in some patients with smoker. In never smoker, it is very low. But if patients have a high tumor mutation burden, immunotherapy can be very effective, especially in lung cancer. Again, that is also dependent on the tumor histology. 
we thought regardless of uh, uh, the tumor type, whether it's head and neck cancer, whether it's colon cancer, TMB, high TMB means great response. But recent studies have shown that that is not always the case. So clearly there is more that we need to understand about how these biomarkers can be better refined. There are various ways you can estimate TMB. One is by using whole exome sequencing. In fact, uh, there are smaller ways we can do it by using targeted NGS panels. There are studies that have shown that doing targeted MBS, uh, NGS panels of 300 genes or so can closely approximate a whole exome sequence. So that will improve, improve the uh, turnaround time, that will improve uh, cost effectiveness of doing these studies. So uh, uh, the approximation is nearly good, is what uh, I understand from reading the literature that compares uh, estimation of TMB using various techniques. Uh, liquid biopsy is a word that we would uh, very commonly hear. What is liquid biopsy? If putting a needle into a tumor is called solid biopsy, then the other way, putting a needle into the bloodstream is called liquid biopsy. In another way, we think that all these tumors, they release DNA. And this DNA, if it test, if you find it, sequence it and test, that's called cell-free DNA fragments, then you may be able to identify the driver for that cancer. In fact, for some tumors, liquid biopsy, like EGFR or ALK or ROS, ROS1, um, uh, it could be very effective uh, in, uh, I'm not sure if ROS1 can be found through liquid biopsy, but I think it can be, I can, uh, Arun can probably guide me in that. But ALK and EGFR are very classic examples uh, where a liquid biopsy is very closely mirroring uh, a tumor tissue biopsy in itself in terms of sensitivity. Uh, so liquid biopsy is an emerging way to figure out if patients can uh, get uh, a targeted therapy. Why is this easy? Why is this important? Because liquid biopsy is fairly easy to do, unlike a tissue biopsy where sometimes the tissue may be deep inside and doing uh, tissue biopsy portends a lot of complications or there is insufficient tumor tissue specimen. In that case, just drawing blood and doing the liquid biopsy is uh, quite uh, sensitive in itself. So much that the College of American Pathologists, which is considered a global leader for uh, establishing guidelines for uh, various cancers, including lung cancer, have recommended uh, using liquid biopsy uh, to replace diagnostic tissue biopsy. So uh, various, uh, you can check liquid biopsy at various ways. You can do it at diagnosis. We can do it at progression. For instance, if a patient with ALK mutation is currently on first generation ALK inhibitor or a second generation ALK inhibitor, and then they progress, whether to see if those patients have a resistance mutation, we can do a liquid biopsy instead of repeating a tissue biopsy. But again, uh, if tissue biopsy is accessible, I believe tissue biopsy is important to do. But um, in the setting of difficult to perform uh, procedure or you do it, but uh, the tissue is insufficient, then liquid biopsy is uh, quite sensitive in itself. Various genomic technologies uh, and companies uh, that uh, offer these products to the practicing oncologists have advanced the field of lung cancer. More importantly, have changed the way uh, people live with lung cancer. I have patients who go to work. Um, I have a, a fully uh, qualified professional scientists who continue to do their work in their field despite having brain metastasis, but having ALK mutation lung cancer. So targeted uh, uh, tissue testing, targeted biopsies, targeted gene sequencing can help uh, identify alterations that can then help us uh, in our clinic as we practice. The big question is, should we do it for uh, a panel of genes, a short panel of genes, or should we do a broad panel-based molecular testing? This is a much debated topic uh, globally. Should we do a, a big 100 gene panel or a 200 gene panel as patients come in, or should we actually do a targeted testing for uh, five uh, panels that have the best uh, likelihood of finding uh, a targeted uh, therapy? This is an emerging uh, uh, debate uh, but I think the uh, issue is more pertaining to the cost. If cost is similar, then I think a broad panel testing at the diagnosis is uh, appropriate in itself. Uh, then I will stop for now. Uh, I'm available to answer your questions uh, from what I can understand the way I practice um, uh, next in sequencing and uh, the, the lung cancer management using genomic testing. I will now uh, keenly await uh, 
Dr. Arun's uh, lecture and presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Raju. It was uh, an excellent presentation. We learned a lot and uh, the, uh, uh, you know, as we say, the lung cancer is kind of the poster child of uh, targeted treatments. We have so many targeted therapies available. Uh, thanks for that uh, excellent presentation. Uh, I'll just uh, share my screen now. So, uh, I thank again, once again, all the participants for uh, joining us in this uh, evening lecture. Uh, I, uh, today, I will be uh, speaking on uh, genetic testing, more on the laboratory and uh, interpretation of the report aspect of the testing. So uh, essentially, this is my agenda. I'll give a brief about the NGS technology and uh, the classification of variants that we pick up in NGS uh, uh, result. Then uh, we'll talk a bit about the workflow in the laboratory and the analysis overall what happens. Then uh, I'll spend some time on various technologies available for testing uh, specific mutations uh, in the lung cancer. And we'll move to the uh, test report, what to see in the report. And finally, certain uh, practical aspects of tissue preparation, which uh, is very crucial for uh, any successful NGS assay. So uh, to start with, there are uh, two major genomic gene sequencing technologies. Uh, one is the Sanger sequencing and the other is the next generation sequencing. So Sanger sequencing is uh, the gold standard method of DNA sequencing, where uh, you sequence, say, around 700, 800 bases at the maximum at a given point of time. But the accuracy of the uh, sequencing that is done in a Sanger equipment is pretty high. On the other hand, in next generation sequencing is a massively parallel sequencing where you can sequence, say, perhaps even the entire genome of multiple individuals in the same run at a given point of time. Although NGS uh, is traditionally known to have a lower accuracy compared to Sanger, with the advancements of bioinformatic tech, uh, you know, algorithms and uh, genome sequencing technology itself on its own, uh, the, uh, the, the accuracy by which you pick up mutations or variants in the next generation sequencing has also terribly improved. So uh, uh, to put in a very small nutshell, Sanger sequencing is very targeted you sequence specific mutations or specific part of a gene in one individual at a time, whereas next generation sequencing, you can uh, sequence multiple genes or perhaps even the whole genome of multiple individuals in the same uh, point of time. So uh, next generation sequencing is supplied in oncology in various aspects. To start with, it all started with the hereditary risk assessment where you know you can evaluate patients for or families that have uh, cancers running from generation to generation you also use ngs for differential diagnosis for example uh, you know specific uh, specific uh, uh, you know cancers such as uh, sarcomas that have specific gene alterations even sarcoma for example their diagnosis is purely based on identification of specific uh, gene alterations that is done by ngs Prognostication based on the mutation profile is possible. Therapy selection is, again, uh, one of the main reasons why this has been so widespread in uh, molecular oncology division is that uh, therapy selection is feasible uh, by uh, doing a large-scale genomic profiling of the tumor tissue. Therapy monitoring, especially monitoring for resistance, is also possible. And surveillance to see if the patient may develop newer disease again, or uh, uh, you know, kind of now technologies are evolving towards MRD estimation in solid tumors. So this surveillance is coming up again in a big way, and multiple clinical trials are going on even for solid tumors. So what exactly is this NGS technology? To uh, give a very brief outline of what happens in the lab for NGS technology is you get a sample, you extract the DNA of the sample chop the DNA into random fragments of 150 base in size. Then you hybridize them with what is called as baits or RNA probes, which are specific to the genes which I'm interested in sequencing. Suppose in the case of non-small cell lung cancer, you're interested to sequence just the EGFR, uh, BRAF, KRAS, ALK, ROS. You have these probes which are uh, against or which are complementary to these genes alone. And they selectively capture these genes and the rest, rest part of the genome is washed away. 
Then you ligate what is called as adapters on either side and take it up for sequencing. Now, of course, this DNA sequencing is, uh, there are at least five or six different chemistries of DNA sequencing of which I'm not going into the details, but essentially this is what happens to every sample that comes in. But the most critical aspect of uh, after all these is the data analysis or most challenging aspect is the data analysis, where for every sequencing run, you get, you get gigabytes of data. And making clinical sense out of that gigabytes of data is what is the real challenging aspect and that really qualifies how good a NGS report is. I will uh, uh, try to uh, impart two imp very important factors of uh, next generation sequencing experiment. One is called as the read depth, the other is called as a gene coverage. Now, understanding of these two metrics is very important to know how good the sequencing is and how well you can uh, uh, trust the report that has come out of a NGS experiment. So say for example, hypothetically, you take a gene of length 1000 basis, which is there in the x-axis in the blue line here. And each black dash that you see here is uh, say uh, 150 base random fragment that you generated during the library preparation. Now, uh, say for example, this is a 300 position of the 1000 base gene. Uh, this particular position is covered in seven different fragments, meaning that the depth of sequencing here is 7x. Or in other words, we have sequenced this particular base of the reference genome seven times in this sample. Whereas here, you have sequenced this only two times. Here, we have sequenced it just one time, meaning a depth of 1x. And in this particular region, you have not got any sequence at all. So, as a thumb rule, for any germline or inherited uh, genome testing, we do a sequencing depth of 80 to 100x on an average, whereas for any somatic testing, we go over and above 250x depth. What it means is that on an average, you're going to sequence every base of that gene 250 times and above in the particular sample. The second estimate is the gene coverage, where uh, say, for example, these reads represent 900 bases of this 1000 base uh, gene, uh, and this 100 base is not represented in any, frag any of the uh, random fragment, then the coverage here is 90%, so which means that 10% of the gene is not covered in the assay at all. So it's quite imperative for a clinician to know what is the gene coverage that is done in the experiment so that uh, he or she knows if the entirety of the gene is covered for the particular clinical indication that is being tested for. So high the, higher the uh, read depth, more accurate is the report, especially when it comes to somatic testing. So for example, you can see here, each one is a random fragment which was sequenced and there is an insertion of two Gs in this position, which is clearly seen in all the fragments that are there. So higher the read depth, more accurate are we in assigning a particular mutation. Now, after the, uh, after the NGS is done, you have the biggest challenge, uh, uh, work of doing what is called as the bioinformatic analysis, which can be overall classified into three phases as primary, secondary, and the tertiary analysis. Primary analysis is essentially the sequence generation, which is done in the sequence or equipment itself, where you get raw uh, reads. Then comes the secondary analysis of the bioinformatic pipeline, where you map every single read to the reference genome and identify the positions of the genome where you have a mismatch. And, hyper, and in all probability, these mismatches are what are called as the mutations, which we are going to analyze in the tertiary analysis based on the clinical picture, based on the uh, various factors about the mutation, and then pick out the particular mutation which is matching with the clinical phenotype and take it up into the analysis. So, you know, one of the largest task force in our uh, company is essentially the bioinformatic and the genome analysis task force, because this itself is a very huge job and that requires a lot of data analysis. So where exactly do you position NGS and how does this come in comparison to other genomic technologies? You can see in this small cartoon. So on the top, on the y-axis, you see the numbers, which are essentially the bases. So this is a single base, this is a 10 base, this is a 100 base, and, uh, and the topmost on the 10 to the power of 9 is at a chromosomal level. Any PCR-based method, say that also includes Sanger sequencing, can pick up genetic aberrations, which are there you know, around 100 bases or 100 to 1,000 bases in size at the maximum. 
Whereas MLPA, which is a technology called multiple ligation probe amplification, can pick up genetic variants in the range of you know, 100 to uh, up to the chromosomal level, where large deletions and duplications can be picked up. Then you have the microarrays, the uh, chromosomal microarrays or the SNP arrays, which can pick up uh, genetic aberrations from you know, around 10 to the power of 4 to the uh, chromosomal level aberrations. All the cytogenetic technologies, such as karyotyping or FISH or spectral karyotyping, are effective in picking up genetic aberrations which are there at a chromosomal level. But theoretically, next generation sequencing can pick up genetic aberrations at all the genomic uh, confirmations or the gene, all the levels of genomic organization that a cell can have. However, the sensitivity may vary as uh, you know, NGS has a reduced sensitivity as the genomic organization level increases. So some of the advantages of NGS over other clinical routine clinical investigations include accuracy, sensitivity, very low quantity of sample required to do the sequencing, high throughput, and the speed at which you get the report. Although, as with any technology, NGS also has certain limitations. It's not that easy to set up an NGS uh, laboratory because it requires very high throughput, high-end informatic infrastructure and bioinformatic expertise. And it is not very accurate in identifying large deletions and duplications. And if the objective of the testing is just to look for a particular point mutation, say, for example, I'm just interested to see whether the patient is having BRAF via uh, V600E mutation or not, then NGS becomes a bit expensive to identify, uh, an, uh, at an economic point of view, it becomes a bit expensive to identify such a point mutation. Such targeted point mutations can very well be picked up by a RT-PCR or other technology. So with this background, we'll move on to what is called as a variant classification. So variant classification is essentially the core of the analysis where we apply various logics to classify a variant. Now, overall, with respect to the biology of the variant, a variant can be a germline variant or a somatic variant. So a germline variant is something that the person has inherited and the variant is there in all the cells of the person's body. Whereas a somatic variant is an acquired variant, which is there in the particular tissue, which is uh, showing the clinical feature, or say, for example, it's a lung cancer, it's there only in the particular cancerous tissue of the lung and not in any other part of the body. A somatic variant can be a driver mutation, which actually drives the uh, oncogenesis. For example, a EGFR exon 19 deletion in a non-small cell lung cancer or a BRCA2 pathogenic mutation in an ovarian cancer will all be driver mutations. Uh, a somatic mutation can also be a bystander mutation, where as the progression of the cancer takes place, multiple mutations get accumulated in the tumor tissue and such mutations tend to be bystander mutations. And these bystander mutations may have a therapeutic uh, implication, may also have a prognostic implication. Certain mutations tend to have a poor prognosis and they are all bystander mutations. Now, be it a germline or somatic mutation, overall, the mutations can be classified as a benign mutation, which almost 99% of all uh, variants or the mutations we pick up in a sample are benign mutations. So what are these? These are the mutations that does not adversely affect the protein. And these mutations are generally seen in very high frequencies in healthy populations. So these are called as the benign mutations or you know, some, many of them are what, is, what we call as polymorphisms that exist in the human population. You also have the other end of the variant, which is called as a pathogenic variant, where uh, you know it could be a driver mutation, or you know that the particular mutation really causes the pathogenesis of the disease. In the middle, you also have a group of variants called as variant of unknown significance, where it is neither a benign nor a pathogenic variant. And these variants don't have high frequencies in the healthy population, nor do we have enough evidences to show the pathogenicity to cause the disease. Now, currently, all the guidelines say that you should not take major clinical decisions based on a variant of uncertain or unknown significance. But it is always good to revisit this variant after a periodic time to see if there are newer clinical evidences or newer uh, literature evidences to show the pathogenicity of the particular variant. Now, we follow the ACMG guidelines for classifying the germline variant and the AMP guidelines to classify a somatic variant. 
I'll just quickly visit what this somatic variant classification is as per the AMP guidelines, because any NGS report is going to have the classification based on this guidelines for a somatic testing. So uh, before that, what are the various factors we take into consideration to classify a variant as a benign or a pathogenic or a uncertain significance? So from the time you, uh, from the, the, the path we take is that when you identify a variant, to the classification of a variant for reporting, the first thing we look for is the phenotype-genotype correlation, whether the particular gene is in fact correlating with the phenotype that is given to us. Second is we predict the effect of the mutation in uh, various uh, in silico prediction programs. There are a battery of seven or eight programs available where you model the mutation and see the model the amino acid change in the protein and see whether that adversely affects the functional domain of the protein or where adversely affects the structure of the protein. We look for evolutionary conservation and most importantly, we do the minor allele frequency check. In other words, this is where we check whether the mutation or the variant is seen in healthy population or not. And there are a battery of different uh, uh, databases that we uh, look for uh, to see the frequency of the variant in healthy population. Finally, we look for literature publications and then comes the report. Now, as per the AMP guidelines, any somatic variant is classified into four tiers as tier one variant, uh, which is essentially a variant of very strong clinical significance. You know, essentially, you, have, you know the variant really causes the disease and also you have the very druggable target for the variant, a classical exome 19 deletion uh, in uh, non-small cell lung cancer comes under the Clat tier one variant, or you know, a, a, a BRCA2 mutation in our ovarian cancer is a tier one variant. Whereas a tier two variant is a variant which you know can cause oncogenesis or can cause the phenotype, but you don't have a druggable target. Say, uh, uh, say for example, a TP53 variant comes under a tier two variant, or you know, hypothetically, I identify a BRCA2 variant in a non-small cell lung cancer then uh, although you have a drug for BRCA in the ovarian cancer or a pancreatic cancer, but you don't have it for a lung cancer. So then it becomes a tier two variant. Then you have the tier three, which is a variant of unknown significance and the tier four is a benign variant about which we just asked for, we just uh, visited. So one point that is very critical to know is that the importance of clinical indications is very important, uh, is very essential because you, uh, you, that is the basis by which you classify a variant. Suppose we get a tissue from a metastatic site and we do not know the primary site, a druggable variant will be classified as a tier two variant because you know, it is uh, not druggable from the metastatic site uh, that was given to us. So uh, understanding of the pathology of the tissue and the immunohistochemistry results of the uh, uh, testing is very essential for us to identify whether there are any druggable targets in the tissue. So what actually happens inside the laboratory when you get a sample is what I'll show as a flow chart here. As soon as we get a uh, tissue, so in this case, we always get a FFP block. The QC is done and we take it up for DNA and RNA extraction. Then there is a probe-based capture of the gene that takes place, the genes of interest takes place, which is a library preparation. And then we take it up for the sequencing in the Illumina sequencer, where it's a pair-dense sequencing and we aim for a depth of over and above 250x. Then comes the raw data, where uh, you do a quality check of the raw data. You have various parameters to do the quality check of the raw data. Then we follow the GATK best practices, including the Burrow-Wheeler alignment and uh, deduplication, recalibration of the variants, etc. And we call the variants. Finally, the, once the variant is caught, you go in for the tertiary analysis where the gene annotation takes place. You identify the somatic variants using in-house developed uh, pipelines such as Low Creek. Then we do the variant annotation and uh, we look for the particular variant uh, present in various uh, databases. And we filter the variant based on minor allele frequency, predict the effect of the variant in uh, various in silico prediction programs, and then classify the variant based on the annotation, clinical picture, effect in the protein, and uh, uh, various databases, and finally generate a report. Now, a critical quality control steps that are there in this are 
one at the sample level where you look for the tumor content, you look for the tissue content, etc. Then we have a quality check at the nucleic acid level where you expect a good quality of DNA and RNA to be extracted. Uh, you have a quality control at the library level, and then you have a quality control at the raw data level, where you check that whether you have enough data to generate or to effectively pick up somatic mutations. Uh, any sample that fails at any of these levels tend to be rejected. So next, I will move on to the molecular testing of non-small cell lung cancer, where uh, you know uh, there are a minimal set of markers that are defined by NCCN to be tested. So starting with the EGFR HAL cross, BRAF, RET, MET, ERBB2, which is HER2, NTRK123, and KRAS. Apart from this, you have cancer agnostic markers like that of PDL1 and TMB. All of these markers are targetable if at all they turn out to be positive. Now, uh, NCCN also clearly mentions what is the technology to be used for uh, testing these markers. So it categorically recommends that wherever feasible, you do a broad panel based approach, typically by NGS. And if you can now consider doing RNA sequencing or RNA based NGS uh, to maximize the detection of fusion events. And uh, uh, this table shows the type of genetic mutation or the aberration that is there for the particular gene and their frequency in the non small cell lung adenocarcinoma, their utility, and the technology that can be used to detect it. So, for genes such as EGFR, BRAF, MET, KRAS, uh, uh, and ERBB2, predominantly point mutations or single nucleotide variants are identified and they can be detected typically by uh, uh, you know NGS sometimes you also have targeted PCR such as RT-PCR previously these were detected by Sanger whereas genes such as ALK, ROS1, uh, you know NTRK, RET all have gene rearrangements which results in a fusion protein fusion gene which can be effectively detected by NGS or it can be screened very well by immunohistochemistry assay and uh, fish. So next I'll move on to comparison of various technologies for EGFR mutation detection. So essentially it's going to be a head-on comparison between the classical ARMS PCR, real-time PCR, droplet digital PCR, Sanger sequencing and NGS. Now, ARMS PCR works on the principle that you have a, a you know, PCR a mutation specific primers uh, in the reaction, and you amplify, uh, you know, a multiple mutations in the same reactions to see if it is amplified or not. Amplification of a particular pr primer uh, set tends to show that the uh, particular mutation is present. Now, uh, real-time PCR is an extension of the ARMS PCR, where again you have mutation-specific primers, but in addition to these, you also have certain probes which are fluorescently labeled, and it is done in a real-time PCR machine. Droplet digital PCR is a further extension or an advancement of the real-time PCR, where again, you still use the same, uh, you know, uh, ARMS PCR primers and the probes, but just that the reaction takes place in a uh, emulsion molecule where you're able to uh, very accurately detect the amplification that is there in every single template of the reaction. Then you have the Sanger sequencing followed by the NGS. Just point to be noted, Sanger sequencing is just kept here for comparison purposes because early on, uh, maybe seven, eight years ago, uh, many of these uh, somatic testing were also done in the Sanger sequencing, but now almost all major guidelines have suggested not to use Sanger sequencing. Method of detection is fluorescent by all of these technologies except ARMS PCR because that's a very classical old method of uh, you know, PCR. And the turnaround time is around three to four days for any PCR-based techniques, whereas uh, for sequencing-based techniques, it takes around two weeks time. Now, a very critical aspect of the report that you get out of these technologies is the mutation load. So what is the mutation load is, what is the number of, or what is the percentage of the cells that has the mutation is an uh, indirect estimate that you get. How we get it, of all the cells, of all the DNA that I extracted, what is the percentage of the DNA that has the mutation? So this mutation load can be picked up by NGS, droplet digital PCR, and real-time PCR. And sensitivity, what I mean here is the uh, limit of detection, where what is the minimum number of cells that should have the mutation to be picked up by the assay? So for ARMS PCR and Sanger sequencing, it's somewhere around 10 to 15%. 
Whereas for a real-time PCR, depending on the type of mutation, again, it ranges from 2 to 5%. For a droplet digital PCR and NGS, it can go as low as 1% and less. So the sample type is tissue for all of them. Whereas for NGS and the droplet digital PCR, you can also use plasma, which essentially what I mean here is the cell-free DNA testing. And the number of mutations of EGFR that is covered. So essentially in ARMS PCR, you can't do more than 20, 25 hotspot mutations. Whereas in real-time PCR and droplet digital PCR, you can pick up up to 40 the mutations known in the EGFR gene. Whereas NGS can pick up all mutations in a single reaction. So next we'll move on to the uh, uh, topic of what to see in a NGS report. So this is how typically a NGS report looks where you have a patient identifier, then a clinical indications, then the result, uh, uh, test result given in a very un unambiguous way. Then you have the list of actionable variants, which are the tier one variants. Then comes the tier two variants. And then of course you have the CAP logo in the report. So we'll just zoom into the main results section. So this is a case of non-small cell lung cancer where it, there you have a mutation in the EGFR gene and it's in the exon 19 of the gene. And while the P dot represents the protein position, which is altered as a result of the mutation. So in this case, the glutamic acid in the 746th position to the alanine in the 750th position, that is the four amino acids are deleted. Now, what you can see here is the sequencing depth is 8,619x depth of sequencing was done and the mutant allele burden was 5.3%. And then comes what are all the approved drugs against this particular variant. So this is a classical exon 19 deletion of the EGFR. And you do see that uh, all first line, second line, and uh, third generation PKIs can be effective. Now, then comes in the part of the report, you have the additional significance. Then we go on to give the details of all the uh, genetic as well as the druggable information, drug information, uh, what I mean is the clinical trial information, et cetera, in the report. Now, interestingly, the same patient who came to us after uh, uh, progression, we did find that the patient had developed three different EGFR mutation, where the uh, exon 19 deletion had a mutation allele burden of 62%. And the patient also had a T790M mutation, which is the classical uh, resistance mutation to the first and second generation TKIs. And then the patient also had a uh, resistance mutation called the C797S mutation, which gives uh, the patient the resistance to even the th third generation TKI, such as osimertidil. Now, what is interesting here is NGS is a fantastic uh, technology by which, based on the mutant allele burden, you're able to appreciate and identify the intratumor heterogeneity. You're able to see how many clones of cells are there inside the same tumor. So this can indirectly tell you how aggressive the cancer is and how the prognosis is going to be for the particular patient. Apart from the uh, you know, uh, obvious uh, uh, therapeutic implications or the therapeutic uh, information that the uh, NGS gives. So this is a case of uh, 62 male non-small cell uh, lung cancer, known case, non-smoker. And we did identify a ALK fusion, EML4 ALK fusion, which is a classical fusion. And in addition to that, there was also a very novel fusion called as a CTLC uh, RPS 6KB1 fusion. Now, this EML4 ALK fusion is uh, a classical uh, fusion in non small cell lung cancer, seen if I'm right in approximately 4 to 5% 5, 5 of non small cell lung cancer cases. And they have uh, actionable drugs, of course, crizotinib, malactinib, et cetera. Now, interestingly, this patient at diagnosis also had a ALK point mutation, where in the exon 23 of the ALK gene, there was a leucine 1196, uh, in the, which is to be in the position 1196, becomes a methionine. Now, this mutation causes resistance to first generation ALK inhibitors, such as uh, Crisotinib. So just because they, were, they did the panel-based approach by NGS, we were able to identify the resistance mutation at diagnostic setting itself. If, the, if only uh, immunohistochemistry was done, although ALK would have been positive in the IHC, this resistance mutation would not have been picked up at all. And the patient would have been given the therapy and uh, there would not be any response to the therapy. 
So uh, this particular mutation, the L1196M mutation is seen in almost 20% of uh, ALK positive non-small cell lung cancers, which are known to have prosotinib resistance. And uh, the SN4 trial is uh, the trial where the seritinib drug is compared with chemotherapy. And it is shown that uh, multiple studies have shown that ser seritinib uh, or those patients who have the L1196M mutation are sensitive to seritinib. And there are also some promising clinical data available, which shows that lorlatinib and brigatinib are also showing some uh, preclinical results uh, in cases where the uh, ALK resistance mutation L1196N is present. So the last part of my talk is going to be purely on the practical aspect of tissue factors, which plays a very crucial role in the success of a NGS assay. So essentially, uh, histological factors such as necrosis, mucus pools, uh, burning effects, you know, uh, microabscesses being present tend to have a very negative effect on the quantity and the quality of DNA we extract from the tissue. The age of the block should be ideally less than three years because as a factor of time, oxidation of the DNA takes place that further leads to uh, uh, fragmentation of the DNA. So the DNA that we extract from a poorly, I mean, very old block tends to be highly fragmented and not uh, usable for a clinical NGS testing. And most critical aspect is the tissue processing factors that contribute to the DNA yield and the quality. So number one is the formalin that is used. Uh, formalin that is used for the fixation of the tissue should be a 10% neutral buffered formalin. And the time lag between the tissue removal and the fixation should be as minimal as possible because uh, if, uh, if that uh, time lag is increased, uh, you know, anoxia sets in and that's again a deterrent factor for the DNA. Fixation time should be around 6 to 48 hours. Of course, this is a very broad time. It totally depends on the type and type of the tissue. Certain tissues require uh, lesser time and certain tissues require longer time. So the point I'm trying to make here is the, the tissue should not be either underfixed or overfixed. Both can have a very deterrent effect on the DNA quality. Contaminants such as acids and heavy metals should be avoided. And especially the decalcification process, if at all there is a bony tissue, the process of decalcification involves using very strong acids and that must be definitely avoided because the acids tend to have a, a negative effect on the DNA. So with this, I thank you all for the patience I, uh, and uh, for your listening to the talk. Uh, we'll be very happy to answer any questions if uh, you can have, if you have any. Thank you. So somebody has raised their hand. No. So Dr. Aju, I have a question for you. Uh, in your experience, uh, how, how, uh, how effective are NGS reports for you? In the sense that, uh, of course, there is a cost effect if everything understood, but uh, doing a broad panel-based testing, has that uh, helped you in your clinical practice at any point of time, Dr. Uh, yes, uh, especially in the setting of uh, compassionate drug use. For instance, Exxon 20 mm. uh, insertion, uh, picking that up uh, and getting posiotinib for a patient. Uh, although it wasn't very tolerable, but at least it helped in uh, my, my care, uh, helped in closure, you know, for patients, relatives. But sometimes, although that experience treating that patient was not very pleasant because the drug wasn't very good, but it showed an example of how a broad panel testing can help. Likewise, uh, I think in lung cancer, that has the best uh, uh, evidence for using a broad panel testing. In fact, we just, uh, uh, we have just submitted our, our report uh, of collating around 223 reports of NGS, broad-based panel testing Various, from various companies uh, through 12 oncologists across India. And we found that uh, about 9% percentage of patients had an available drug target okay. that eventually got a drug. 
Okay. So, I mean, a larger number of patients have a drug target, but they may not get a drug because it's not available or because, uh, you know, patient is not fit. So we want to do a real world study to see what actually, what are the odds that a patient will actually get a drug after a broad-based testing and across tumor types, not just lung. Lung was about 23% uh, was lung cancer patients, but that is around 9%. Okay. That's, that's exciting to know, uh, especially uh, this paper, I would be uh, glad to see when it comes out because that shows the real world picture of how uh, this can be useful. And there is also another uh, very interesting subset of patients, although it's quite rare, uh, we do come across cases where you have two driver or two actionable mutations in the same patient. For example, I think I, we recently came across a case of uh, EGFR mutated as well as ALK positive case. Although it's a very small subset, uh, how do, uh, have you come across such cases in your practice? How do you go about yeah. it? Yeah, yes, sir. So I especially recall a patient with EGFR mutation and ALK positive uh, tested through broad-based panel testing. Um, although the report was uh, reported both as uh, simultaneously positive, uh, it created a lot of confusion. So we got back to the scientists and uh, thanks to very astute uh, work behind the scenes. Actually, I'm not ashamed to say this much, you know. Um, you know, we were able to uh, find which was the more relevant alteration for that patient and which was possibly uh, a false call or, you know, I don't even know if it's a false call, but, you know, over call. Um, and uh, we targeted the patient with the right one, which is ALK, ALK targeting. And patient responded beautifully and continues to respond. Uh, I have raised this in uh, Twitter, in Med Twitter, uh, okay. you know, with experts across the world. This is exactly the same case, and it brought up a lot of discussion across specialists, across experts who are leaders in the field from across the US and Europe. And everybody is confused how to manage this. One of the world's foremost authorities in precision medicine is a lady in uh, currently in uh, California. Mm -hmm. I forgot her name, uh, but uh, she suggested using brigatinib because apparently that has some action in EGFR as well as in AV. Uh, but, uh, you know, the predominant trend was it could be just one of them. Use ALK at first and see how things go, and it worked. I know Tata Group is trying to collate their experience of simultaneous uh, yeah. mutations. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That, that, that's, again, uh, one of the common things discussed in various tumor boards is to look for, if it is a point mutation, you can compare the mutant allele fraction and see which is the predominant clone and start treating with that. But however, when one is a point mutation, the other is a fusion, you don't get a comparison of the uh, exact comparison between the mutation burden between the two. So that really uh, becomes a challenge. Uh, unless you uh, have, uh, a, yeah. yeah. Arun, we have a question, actually two, two good questions. Uh, the first question is why sometimes clinicians ask for ALK mutation? I think I can answer that. It is yes, mainly sir. to look for resistance. Uh, is there any mutation that could be uh, a, a symbol of uh, or a signifies a resistance to one of the uh, generation of drugs? Uh, Arun just mentioned about uh, a particular mutation that shows resistance to first generation ALK inhibitor. Uh, the second question I leave to Arun because we have just encountered this very ident identical case now. Yeah. Uh, the question is: Is it valid doing ALK mutations in li liquid biopsy? Yeah. So I'll give you what I did, actually. Mm -hmm. Patient with on alectinib mm -hmm. uh, for about two years, patient has progressed. Uh, there is the option of doing liquid biopsy, or there's an option of doing tissue biopsy because it's a very peripheral tumor nodule. I decided to go forth and do the uh, tissue biopsy because it was very accessible. But in a similar context, I think liquid biopsy is probably easy, uh, you know, sensitive enough. But I'll leave you to answer that question. Sure. So again, uh, when it comes to ALK, the, we have to see at what setting we are going to do this testing of liquid biopsy. If it, at, if it is at diagnosis, you are more uh, you know, prone to do a test for a gene fusion event or a gene translocation uh, event, which uh, ideally the liquid biopsy is still not well validated across the globe, but for one or two tests available in an international level, which can detect gene fusions in the liquid biopsy setting. However, if it's at a progression level where you're looking for ALK resistance mutations, they are all point mutations, which can very well be picked up in a DNA sequencing, which is done in a liquid biopsy setting in the CTDNA. 
So uh, to, to put in simple terms, if you're looking for gene fusions in ALK, liquid biopsy is still not well validated because there are a lot of, uh, there, it requires a lot of validation to be done. Whereas uh, if it is to look for point mutations in the ALK, which is typically what you see for resistance mutations, then uh, uh, it's well done, uh, well covered in the liquid biopsy setting. Thank you, that is something I learned. So ROS one is similar? ROS is also extra, very similar. Uh, resistance mutations are all point mutations in general. Uh, on behalf of the uh, MedGenome team, I would really like to thank our speakers, uh, Dr. Raju Matthew and Dr. Arun. And we would like to uh, you know, thank everyone for being here at this uh, time and attending the webinar. And uh, I would just like to tell everyone that if there are any further questions, you can reach out to us at diagnostics at the rate medgenome.com. And this video recording will be available uh, on our YouTube channel, channel, Medgenome YouTube channel. So thanks a lot and good night.